China, as you may appreciate, is something of a stepchild in U.S. strategic policy. Uh, when, for example, it comes to the question of missile defense and China, is missile defense about China or not? We tend to pose the question, should we think of China like a little Russia or a big rogue state? In other words, we have some pre-existing categories in our missile defense policy that we try and fit China in, when in fact, of course, the strategic relationship with China is its own, is unique. Uh, we've also left, generally, the business of nuclear and strategic policy vis-a-vis -vis China to the community of experts in the United States that are best called China watchers. We, we, we don't leave the strategic relationship with Russia to the Russia watchers, uh, or the strategic relationship to North Korea with the North Korea watchers. Uh, but in the case of China policy, we've tended to look to that small group of people who are who can access the original materials and the original language, and who, who think more about China and the way China works than about the U.S.-China relationship and U.S. policy towards China in, in the strategic domain. <clears throat> and we at CGSR have been trying to uh, repair this, this gap in our uh, toolkit on China and strategic policy. Uh, and we're very pleased that uh, Dr. Michael Nacht uh, was interested in authoring for us a, a Livermore paper. A year ago, we started something called the Livermore Paper Series, uh, of which we've produced a total of one so far, and Michael's will be the second in the series. Uh, Michael Nacht, uh, well known to almost everyone in the room, I think, certainly to the laboratory community, professor of public policy at UC Berkeley, uh, I had the pleasure of serving, as, of serving as one of his deputies when he was in the office of the Secretary of Defense early in the Obama administration as Assistant Secretary for Global Strategic Affairs. This was an organization that was built, the Global Strategic Affairs uh, component, was built in order to run the experiment in cross-domain. Uh, it was one organization under Michael's leadership that did nuclear and missile defense policy, my portfolio, but also cyber, outer space, <coughs> and countering WMD. Um, Michael and his successor, Madeline Creeden, uh, ran this organization uh, well and effectively, and then when they left, they stood down the organization and broke it apart because it was easier to put the domain pieces connected to something else rather than make this cross-domain strategy work. Um, but it put Michael in the position of being one of the leading thinkers about how to fit the multiple domains into the larger purposes and structure of U.S. strategic policy. And some of you have heard him speak on that topic as well. His role as Assistant Secretary of Defense was his second Senate-confirmed appointment. His first was in the Clinton administration as an Assistant Director of the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency for Strategic and Eurasian Affairs. And in between those two stints in government, he served as Dean of the School of Pub uh, Public Policy, the Goldman School at UC Berkeley from 1998 to 2008. Uh, well known to all of you who have done research in this field, he's an author of six books, more than 80 articles and book chapters, including a recent book that he co-edited with uh, Ron Lehman and Zach Davis at CGSR on strategic latency, and world power. Please join me in welcoming Michael Knight. Thank you, Brad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brad, and it's great, great to be with you. This is a, uh, an effort at a kind of fresh look at China. Uh, we decided to put aside our thoughts and uh, look at some data understand what the Chinese have been writing, saying, and doing on strategic policy and nuclear policy. And uh, we've had the benefit of several terrific student interns at CGSR. Sarah Laterman, who's going to speak as part of the initial findings. Uh, Catherine Breckbuehl, who's a student at the Air Force Academy and has Chinese language skills. Nick Jones, who graduated from uh, 
Loyola in Los Angeles and going into Army intelligence, and Julie Beeston, who also has Chinese uh, language skills. So um, our aim was to try to understand what, what we think the Chinese are up to, if that's possible, and then to figure out what we're doing and saying and how does it meet uh, U.S. national objectives and whether uh, it's really relevant to what Chinese are thinking and doing. How do I move this thing forward? This thing. A couple of prefatory comments. Uh, I think as a follow-on in a way to what Brad said, uh, we've in the strategic studies community, we have a lot of thoughts about the role of nuclear weapons derived from the Soviet experience in the Cold War. And we've tried to retain as many of them as possible in the post-Cold War world and apply them to the Russians and also apply them to the Chinese. Uh, in a nutshell, during the Cold War, uh, US nuclear weapons had several missions, uh, obviously to deter a nuclear attack on the United States by the Soviet Union, to deter an attack by the Soviet Union on our allies, to deter a Soviet conventional attack in primarily in Europe, and to reassure our own allies of the credibility of our security guarantees, which also was part of actually a non-proliferation policy. It was intended to diminish the interest of our allies in acquiring nuclear weapons. The term strategic stability, which Brad is delving into in enormous uh, detail, is a major thought leader on. In a nutshell, we think during the Cold War, strategic stability had two primary meetings from an American perspective, and they were crisis stability and arms race stability. Crisis stability, you and I are in a crisis situation. We want to make sure it doesn't get out of control. It's not going to get out of control if each of us has secure second strike capability. Probably. Arms race stability is that there wouldn't be incentives to continue uh, to race to get ahead and build more weapons. Now, I actually think this is a separate uh, matter. I'm not sure there ever was much arms race stability with the Soviet Union. I think the Soviets were racing pretty much throughout. And then, actually, the Reagan policy was not to try to induce stability, but to outrace them. And in fact, in, the, in that process, to strain their economy very much. I personally don't think it was the single cause of the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it definitely didn't help them. So uh, stability is an important subject. It's central to current American defense policy and thinking. And we need to try and keep wrapping our heads around what does it mean in the new, new environment. So that's a brief summary on the nuclear weapons connection to the Soviet Cold War situation. Now, our bottom line, bottom line up front on China is the following, and then we'll get back into how we come to justify some of these conclusions. Oh, and by the way, this is all preliminary. This is the first time we're presenting this material. We're open to all suggestions, comments, criticism. Now, I've been teaching at Berkeley now 20 years. And I've hardly ever gotten a question in class, only criticism. So I'm open to all thoughts. Uh, and uh, and that, that's really true. Any aspect of this you think we're missing, we're mischaracterizing, uh, please, we're op we really would like your, your thoughts as we go into the next phase of this work. So here's a brief summary of our initial thoughts. That US nuclear forces have a limited role in managing the US-China strategic competition. Anecdotally, uh, we heard at a recent uh, a workshop that Brad ran that in eight years under Obama, in, in summit meetings with the Chinese leadership, nuclear weapons never came up. Now, that doesn't say it's not important, but the fact that it was totally absent says something about uh, their role. And the Kissinger book, Here's a man, 88 years old. He's now 94. 88 years old, he wrote a 550-page book on China. Pretty good deal if you get it. No word of nuclear weapons in 500 pages. So I think 
he thought nuclear weapons were central to U.S.-China policy, he would have at least had it in the index. It's not there. Uh, we don't see nuclear weapons and U.S. nuclear forces being very influential at all in slowing China's maritime expansion, which is very pronounced. Uh, it's very systematic. Uh, it's very clear cut. Beyond our current capabilities, it's not clear that U.S. nuclear forces are going to be very influential in shaping China's behavior in seeking to resolve the North Korean crisis over their uh, ICBM capability that could someday hit the United States, the key element of the, of the Trump policy. Where nuclear weapons can play a role, but it's still tricky and we're still trying to sort it out, is in the event of a threatened Chinese attack or invasion of Taiwan, where we think we do have to have very robust conventional and nuclear weapons that are judged by the Chinese to be usable and effective in order to deter their initial act. This is where deterrence really, where the rubber meets the road in U.S.-China relations. And in terms of strategic stability, and we'll come to that in more detail in a minute, uh, I think the bottom line was well summarized by Laura Solomon, who's a very well-known China expert in the book by Bridge Colby on strategic stability, that the Chinese see the concept of strategic stability as a euphemism for U.S. containment of China. And therefore, they're very reluctant to engage in strategic stability talks or speak in those terms when we meet with them. Uh, we're going to go through four main elements here. We'll talk briefly about Chinese historical and political perspectives and how they affect their military strategy. We'll talk about their policy and capabilities, and Sarah's going to give you quite a bit on their capabilities in a minute, and determine how that affects the changing aspects of their strategy. We'll look briefly at some of the top Sino-American security issues that could uh, lead to grave tensions and could possibly escalate to nuclear use. And then let's look at some critical choices for the United States. So those are our four pieces of, uh, of our argument here. So the first is historical and political perspective. I'll go over this part. Uh, of course, Sun Tzu, the most widely read a Chinese uh, philosopher and strategist and historian uh, wrote many things. The slim book, The Art of War, is a great way to get into it. And there's constant emphasis on deception, preparedness, and threat assessment in that book. In fact, Sun Tzu basically says it's never wise to tell the adversary anything. If you reveal what you have or what you know, what you think. Either you reveal weaknesses to them that the adversary can exploit, or you will reveal strengths to them that then they will seek to counter. So it's best not to say much. And I think they're very good at doing that. I've had experiences myself. Brad's met with uh, Chinese at multiple levels many times. I had an interesting experience back in the Clinton years meeting with Clinton summit with Jiang Zemin, who was predecessor to uh, President Hu Jintao before uh, Xi Jinping. And it, it's sort of an exercise in, in sort of verbal sumo wrestling without ever touching yourself. Um, over the last 60 years, empirically, uh, the Chinese have fought wars or observed wars, and they derive lessons from wars. They study everything in enormous detail. In the Korean and Vietnam Wars, they were under threat of nuclear blackmail, which elevated their, their importance in the, the importance of nuclear weapons in Chinese eyes. In the first Gulf War, which they did not participate in, they were shocked by the ability of the United States using smart weapons and other techniques to dismember uh, uh, the Iraqis in Kuwait when they had a capability roughly equivalent to the Iraqis at the time. I think the Iraqis had the fifth largest uh, army in the world at the time of the first Gulf War, and they were just dismembered in, 
week away in a couple of weeks. And even the Belgrade embassy bombing, when we allegedly miscalculated and bombed their embassy, they used that internally to stroke anti-American sentiment. Uh, and uh, they also used it to build support abroad. On Chinese military strategy, a nice place to start is with the concept of wei shi, uh, which includes both deterrence and compellence. And this is a nice way to begin, because you know we, since Schelling's writings in the 60s, we differentiate clearly between deterrence and compellence. Deterrence, where we want to convey a threat to prevent action, and compellence, where we seek to convey a threat to stop something that's already happening noting that compellence is much more difficult than deterrence. In the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example, the US used both compellence and deterrence. Right? Kennedy spoke to the nation and said an attack, uh, use of nuclear weapons anywhere in the Western Hemisphere would be an attack on the United States leading to a US retaliation against the Soviet homeland. That's a deterrent threat. Um, at the same time, uh, we had a, a naval quarantine around Cuba seeking to compel them to withdraw missiles they had already placed in Cuba. So that was a compellent threat. A key point about Wei Shi is deterrence and compellence are combined in the Chinese language, and the differentiation between offense and defense is not clear. It's part of a sort of holistic concept. Wei Shi is a game, you know, it's also Go, a Chinese play Go, uh, the Russians play chess, chess we're more familiar with. We want to achieve total victory. In Wei Shi, there's not total victory. It's about political and psychological moves. It's a game of surrounding pieces. It's about protracted campaigns, relative advantage, being very sensitive to adversary reinforcements. It involves strategic encirclement. Uh, in other words, if you're playing the Chinese, they hope to get you in a position without a shot being fired that you realize you're in a hopeless state and you acquiesce to their defense. That's very different than you know, taking the queen and putting the king in checkmate. As China integrates into contemporary international relations, it's applying these, uh, these ideas and modernize them for psychological uh, effect while maintaining a very opaque strategy. One cannot overemphasize that what they say can bear very little relationship to what they do, even in the most official documents. But they are continuing to build and build very smartly their nuclear forces. They're still small in relative terms to the United States but they're increasingly flexible. Of course, they make every effort to highlight their vulnerability, that they're in vulnerability. And uh, they could possibly use these weapons in regional conflict situations. We'll come to that in a couple of minutes. A couple of lessons from, uh, that we think the Chinese have derived from limited war. In Vietnam, um, U.S. discussed nuclear use a few times, remember Quezon, uh, but the Chinese practiced restraint. Actually, if you look at the Chinese role in their own conflicts, it's very carefully calibrated, controlled, limited use of force. Uh, they were concerned and perhaps did prepare for a nuclear attack by the United States, and they realized during that period their vulnerability. Of course, the Vietnam War ended if you say, uh, you know, by 19, because the helicopter left the embassy in 72, by 75 it was all over. By 79, uh, Deng Xiaoping was in power, and the whole thrust of his uh, approach was economic strength, um, but with, without in any way uh, denigrating the role of military power. In the 69 Sino-Soviet border conflict, the Russians also threatened the Chinese with nuclear weapons. And again, China was concerned about miscalculation and inadvertent escalation. 
By the way, one of the slippery areas which we love to get more into, and I know is of great interest to Brad, is we're finding very, very little in anything they're saying or even doing that reveals their views about escalation or de-escalation. It just isn't there. But maybe you have found it where we have not. So we look forward to that. There have been, of course, multiple Taiwan Strait crises, and the most recent one in the Clinton years. I remember I was in government at the time, and there was a lot of concern that this could lead to war with China. Uh, the Chinese realized that there were dangers of miscalculation and miscommunication, and they wanted to make sure that by that time China was a nuclear state, although obviously far inferior to the United States, that this wouldn't escalate into a use of force, and they backed down. And in general, they've refrained from coercive military action in Taiwan since. So that's 20, 20 years. Um, if they miscalculated U.S. resolve in 1995, 1996, they don't want to miscalculate going forward. Key international relationships, very briefly on the U.S., Russia, Japan, and the one I'd like to focus on, maritime. Uh, there's an asymmetry here with the U.S. The U.S. sees China as a rising power, seeking hegemony through offensive means. China views the U.S. as a fading but still very dangerous power whose actions in the region are attempting to contain China. It's possible that we could get into a shootout with the Chinese inadvertently, and that's a theme of Graham Allison's new book, The Thucydides Trap. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. He's promoting it quite a lot. And uh, a word about that, Allison had a team at the Belfast Center at Harvard look at 16 historical cases of a rising power versus a status quo power over the last 500 years. And out of the 16 cases, 12 times it led to war where the status quo power sought to preempt the rising power before it got to be so threatening. Um, uh, one of the original sources of this work was Thucydides' Peloponnesian War, the Athens-Sparta situation, which is a perfect example of a rising power and a status quo power. Uh, so a question could be, could the U.S. and China actually get into some very nasty situation almost inadvertently, nothing planned? Of course, the First World War, the uh, assassination in Sarajevo started the war. It wasn't in the war plans of the Germans or the British or anybody else. Um, I was thinking, uh, driving over here, this recent tragedy of the American destroyer where seven naval uh, seamen were killed, and the captain was badly hurt by being rammed by a Japanese cargo ship. Supposing that was a Chinese destroyer. And it was inadvertent. It was foggy, it was late, people were asleep. And the Chinese ship smashed into the American ship, and seven American seamen were killed. And supposing that was even at a time when things were more tense with China than they are now. What would have happened? It's unanswerable, but it gives you a little bit of flavor that rather than just focusing on calculated efforts to be aggressive toward one another, inadvertent incidents could trigger something very dangerous. Uh, with Russia, there's unquestionably a growing affinity of Chinese policy toward Russia. The 2001 Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation includes bilateral security agreements, and the Russians are definitely meeting with, assisting, advising the Chinese, and goes both ways on military matters. The recently established economic, economic corridor among Russia, China, and Mongolia suggests a growing shared interest between Putin and Xi Jinping. By the way, uh, uh, just looking at the leadership, uh, Putin is going to come up for re-election soon, probably has a fair chance of winning. Uh, I'm not a betting man, but I think, you know, if 
I think that's 2018. Six-year term gets into 2024. So if you count the Medvedev period as part of the Putin period, then Putin will have been in power from 2000 to 2024. So roughly 25 years, and that's as long as Stalin was in power. And I think he'd really like to see, uh, it's a separate subject, but the enormity of Russia's resurgence and Putin's stature tightly linked. Xi Jinping also will come up, uh, will have a term that will end in 2022. So we're going to be living for the next, and of course, if Donald Trump is reelected, he's in power until 2024. So these same three individuals will be managing this trilateral relationship for the next uh, number of years. Uh, by the way, Xi Jinping is the first Chinese leader to be born after the revolution. The revolution, of course, was in 49. He was born in 53. And he does represent new thinking about China's future. We'll come to that. Finally, with Japan, it's this, as you probably know, a very uh, um, sort of separated uh, uh, relationship, animosity from the historical experience of Japanese invasion of China, regional competitor in the islands, quite close economic relations and the U.S. umbrella over Japan, seen by the Chinese as containment of China. And let me talk now briefly a bit more about the maritime situation. We have, uh, there are about 30 slides in this deck. I'm going to go much more quickly soon. But we have about 90 slides. So there's a lot of stuff on the maritime maps and so forth we can show at a later time. We'd love to talk to people if you're interested in the maritime uh, question. I think the maritime expansion is central to Chinese strategy. It's active defense, and it achieves multiple objectives of all sorts. They're seeking to enhance their influence, just showing that they can move out, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. You could have some law of the sea ruling or whatever. It doesn't matter. They're probably going to be able to put a nuclear uh, missile capable submarine in that first in that first zone which could be useful against any american forces that come their way there are a lot of rich natural resources in the area it meets economic interests it splits america from its allies to some degree because you have so many multiple claims the philippines vietnam and so forth and the Chinese are seeking to play one off against the other. Weakening America's allies is a core element of Chinese strategy. It can demonstrate a modest decline in American influence because they're moving out and there's nothing that Chi um, uh, the Americans can do about it. It's potentially part of a platform for a Taiwan invasion, combining coercive actions, maritime blockades, missile campaigns, and an amphibious invasion. So this is not just uh, hunting for minerals. This is not just the Navy getting a few more uh, uh, green lights from the leadership to go, uh, go and expand. This is part of an integrated, comprehensive strategy achieving all of these objectives. Quite significant. And when you read about Chinese uh, thinking about their maritime strategy, to the extent you can believe what they say they are thinking, it's quite important. Now let's turn briefly to Chinese strategic policy and capabilities. We'll start with Chinese nuclear, and I'll turn it over to Sarah. All right, thanks. Um, so I'm a nuclear engineer, but I study a lot of public policy. So I'm going to talk about their nuclear pol their nuclear policy and what their actual force structure looks like and get a little bit into ballistic missile defense as well as that fits all together. So first I want to talk about what the Chinese government is actually saying about their nuclear posture, which as the subtitle suggests, it's not necessarily what they'll do, especially in the heat of battle. We're not quite sure what anybody would do in that case. 
Um, first, the bedrock of their declaratory policy is no first use. However, the government is unwilling to comment on activities that might happen in marginal cases, such as if their nuclear weapons were attacked by non-nuclear forces or even threatened by conventional forces, would they abandon this no first use policy? It's very unclear and they don't want to comment about it because they don't, they want to maintain this strong stance towards no first use. So they, so it plays into their narrative about active defense. Now, um, their weapons are not on alert and they're not aimed at other countries during normal operations and in peacetime. And it's thought that their weapons are separated from their delivery systems, so they're not actually mated during normal operations. However, this is what they say. Again, we're not quite sure what they actually do. Now, I threw up this quote from the, their most recent defense white paper just to show that their primary stated goal in all their literature is deterrence. And they seem to be accomplishing this through minimal deterrence, which means that they want a survivable second strike, but nothing more. Again, it plays into their defensive posture. Their, what they're trying to say is, we just want to defend ourselves against nuclear aggression and nothing else. We don't seek to have a nuclear, like numerically superior force. So now let's talk about how the Chinese perceive our own declaratory posture. In the 2010 Nuclear Posture Review, there was no solid definition of strategic stability, although the term is used a lot when discussing Sino-American nuclear relations. Now, because of this lack of clarity, there's Chinese concern that in Americans trying to accomplish strategic stability, the Chinese will be forced to be more transparent, which they believe will weaken their deterrence posture, as Dr. Noth was talking about before. Additionally, there's concern over putting China in this Russian mold, again, as we discussed earlier. Because the two countries are mentioned together so much in the nuclear posture review, it's always China and Russia, China and Russia. They're concerned that the US views, <clears throat> pardon me, the US views China's nuclear force as the same as Russia's, which they're very concerned over. And again, all this is exacerbated by the US conventional and ballistic missile defense improvements and the fact that there were some comments on bringing China into the disarmament regime, which they strongly disagree with because they feel the US and Russia need to disarm because they're vastly numerically superior before China even discusses disarmament. Now, subsequently, talks on strategic stability with China have not been fruitful for all the reasons we've talked about. Why would a country actively seeking to expand its power and influence try to work towards this concept with the status quo power? It's just not in their stated goals or even their implied goals. So now I want to shift to actually talk about what their nuclear forces look like. And for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to discuss the highlights because you can spend years looking into this, and people do. And excuse me, this is all unclassified. Yeah. This that's entire study is unclassified. So. It's all unclassified, all open source material. I do want to, that's a good preface for this. In a recent PLA reorganiz reorganization, their strategic forces have been given more importance, which could signal an increase in focus on nuclear issues by Chinese leadership. They're basically on the same level as the Army, Navy, and Air Force at this point. Now, China is currently thought to only have a nuclear dyad. They have ICBMs, which the number of launchers has stayed pretty stable since 2011. They have intermediate range ballistic missiles, and they have submarines. There is a latent air capability, but there's the nuclear mission for that is very unclear at this moment, as is their nuclear capabilities for cruise missiles. Now, they're undergoing a lot of modernization, a lot of modernization. Um, this includes MIRVing, additional road mobile improvements, switching from liquid to solid fuel, which lowers your alert time. Um, they're doing a lot of nuclear command and control updates. They are also making quieter SSBMs. And back on the strategic bomber side, they are doing a follow-on, and the most recent DOD report on their military power, which just came out in the last month, states that they are potentially looking for a nuclear mission in the near future, but again, it's really ambiguous. It's coming from a couple of statements by Chinese individuals, but we're not quite sure whether they're actually gonna develop this triad or not. So all of this is to say, the Chinese are modernizing at a pace and scope that far outsizes, out exceeds everything that we're doing with our own arsenal. 
Now I'm gonna shift slight focus over to their ballistic missile defense. And again, for the sake of brevity, I don't wanna like go into details, but the bottom line is they're expanding their capabilities greatly and they do, they're trying to do this so they can ensure a survivable second strike. That's their main goal, their stated goal. They really wanna maintain the second strike, so ballistic missile defense is a way to ensure that. Now, they just signed a large contract with the Russians, and a lot of their technology comes from the Russians. Again, there's this Russia-China cooperation in military, in te military technology. But through this whole expansion project, they've been developing and expanding their own domestic ballistic missile defense capabilities. So we could see a lot more coming from their own, from the domestic side in addition to Russian cooperation. And again, it's really important to look at how they view our ballistic missile defense. Because their own ramp up in this area is due in large part to our ballistic missile defense. China is especially concerned that BMD when paired with a prompt global strike capability, if that ever happens, it could, it could really weaken China's deterrence as not only would the US be able to attack China's nuclear forces, but then the, China could not even, they couldn't conduct a second strike because our own ballistic missile defense would defeat their, defeat their nuclear weapons. Now, China's not reacting to this with an arms race, but they're improving their space, cyber, hypersonic glide, other defeat mechanisms in order to combat their BMD and to ensure the survivability of their nuclear forces. There's also been concern that the US might weaponize space as part of these BMD improvements. And China is very vocal against the weaponization of space. It's in all their defense white papers. It's in many of their statements. However, they are conducting R&D in this area and they've looked at this so it's a little hypocritical in their declaratory policy versus what they're actually doing, which seems to be sort of the bottom line of this talk. <laughs> um, additionally, as the US modernizes its nuclear force, China is likely further to expand its own BMD. And depending on what the current nuclear posture review and the current ballistic missile defense review come out with, this could further exacerbate this problem and lead to China building up its BMD capabilities even further. Okay. So what does this all mean? How does it all fit together to affect long-term strategy? Well, as we've discussed, China is moving to improve all of its theater capabilities to acquire regional influence, especially in a Taiwan scenario, and to ensure that they can deny US access or attack to China homeland. The PLA's great focus in recent years has been integrating information, cyber, space, communications, electronic warfare, in order to take the early advantage in any scenario and to protect their own forces because they can blind the enemy, they can prevent the enemy from penetrating their airspace, from penetrating their cyber communications, and they can greatly weaken the adversary. Now, China is working to evade BMD, as I discussed, with hypersonic glide, other countermeasures, because they really do feel an existential threat from BMD, especially in South Korea, as everybody I'm sure has been reading in the news. Um, and I include this quote from Colby, who's an American analyst, who is another one of these China watchers, I guess. <laughs> um, right, yeah. Um, they want options so they can manipulate any scenario in battle, even in the face of a numerically superior adversary like the US. That's what they're, that's, the whole goal of them developing their space, their cyber, and integrating all of this is so they can have options during any battle, and they can really take that early advantage like I was discussing. And finally, I wanna leave you on maybe a depressing note. <laughs> um, an important potential change they have is this discussion about launch on warning. Now, it's just been rumblings. It's not been integrated. It's not been, it's just speculation at this point. But if this is implemented, it can change this calculus entirely and affect escalation management and war control because you know, they could get a little trigger happy during a conflict if they're seen as losing. So on that note, I'm gonna pass it back to Dr. Nacht for further discussion. Thank you, Sarah. The second part of uh, this phase is on Chinese integrated strategic deterrence. So, uh, again, stemming from the earliest times, uh, the Chinese view national power as military plus non-military capabilities in a wide variety of areas. 
And of course, this combined effort is what we're calling A2AD, anti-access area denial, on the part of the Chinese to deter or prevent the United States from intervening in case the Chinese go to war in Taiwan or do something else very aggressively. There's pronounced focus on space and cyber capabilities. And there's no doubt that the Chinese see themselves and the United States becoming more reliant. They don't seem yet, as far as what we can tell, to have integrated, from the term integrated uh, duty deterrence, the, the role of space and cyber. But they're working the problem hard. On the economic front, uh, I know this would seem like a little distant from your own personal interests, but we cannot overemphasize the importance that the Chinese apply to their own economic strength. This recent initiative, One Belt, One Road, this was a major meeting in May of this year with 65 nations present, heads of state, Putin was there. This was announced as a Xi Jinping initiative at the end of 13, and it's been being implemented since. Uh, the name of the game essentially is to have a Eurasian network of states with China in the lead uh, that would elevate China to the world's global economic leader. Um, the fact that the US has recently withdrawn from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, China's ASEAN free trade area is growing. There's a sense, I think, in the region that Chinese influence is definitely rising. America's economic influence is declining. And the Chinese economic influence is directly connected to military objectives. It is not divorced. A nice recent example is the Chinese pressure on the South Koreans not to deploy FADs. And here you have a US ally, South Korea, security agreement with them since 1953. We think they need that. A lot of their military think they need that. The Chinese, who currently account for 25 or 26 percent of all exports and imports to South Korea, economic leverage, Chinese tell the South Koreans, you don't need that. And the South Koreans have now suspended that so the point is that economic strength provides them political leverage and even military leverage on key national security capabilities. A little bit more on anti-access area denial. We use the term <clears throat> uh, to dissuade, deter, or defeat third party intervention during a large scale theater campaign. China does not use the term. Uh, this would include a whole range of capabilities I won't uh, go into now. Uh, whether China views nuclear as part of A2AD is less clear, again, because they do have a no first use doctrine, although we don't know how that relates to their operational uh, plans. Presumably, a key element of Chinese strategy is if there is a real crisis in Taiwan, to have unmistakable for China to have unmistakable, invulnerable nuclear forces that could hit the United States as a deterrent to dissuade the United States from intervening conventionally in the Taiwan conflict. Uh, space, there are some experts in the room who know a lot more, especially on the classified side, about what the Chinese are doing. They had the famous ASAT test in 2007. Not clear that they worry so much about the debris that resulted from that test, which there was a lot of it. Maybe as they get more satellites in space, they will. Um, they have the most functioning satellites in orbit now other than the United States. Of course, that also makes them vulnerable. And US space capabilities are cloaked in secrecy. So uh, you'd have to have a much more finely grained understanding details to know um, what the balance of power in space is. The Chinese are modernizing virtually all aspects of their space systems, communications, 
intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance, navigation, exploration, launch vehicles, command and control, and ASAT. They've launched a quantum satellite. Uh, uh, they have a suite of monitoring and warning systems to help assure second strike capability. They're developing directed energy weapons, satellite jammers, they're vague about capabilities while preaching deterrence. They're against weaponization of space, as Sarah said, which is a defensive posture, while at the same time acquiring capabilities for offensive weapons in space. So there's no doubt that space is a very high priority, space capabilities are a very high priority in their, in their evolution of their military uh, thinking. On cyber, they're leading innovators in supercomputing. In a recent competition, they were one and two, was the uh, most advanced supercomputers in the world. US leading in quantum computing, but China leads in quantum communications, a proof of concept to facilitate communication invulnerable to eavesdropping and de-encryption. Uh, China has enormous cyber capability already. The attacks even a few years ago on American businesses and defense networks prompted Keith Alexander, when he was still head of NSA, to say that what we are witnessing is the greatest theft of intellectual pro property in world history. I remember when I left the government around 2011 or 12, I was at an unclassified meeting of US experts on China cyber, and uh, one of this spokesperson got up, this is now five, six years ago, and he said, if you look at the top 100 US companies, high tech, financial, the companies you'd most want information from if you were the Chinese, he said they fall into two categories. Half of them are completely penetrated by the Chinese, which means if you work in that company and you turn on your computer, there's a guy in Beijing who's looking at the same computer and the companies are doing everything they can to protect, to deny, to uh, minimize the impact of that intrusion. That's half the company. The other half of the companies are completely penetrated by the Chinese, which means that if you turn on a computer and you work there, there's somebody in China looking at the same computer, but they don't know about it. That's the list of the 100 companies. So Chinese cyber infusion uh, and related uh, efforts both to gain information uh, but also possibly to disrupt and disable US systems is really on a massive scale. Um, I'm going to skip the rest of this in the interest of time. Um, there's even more on cyber strategy. I want to skip that too. Let me go quickly to the Chinese, US issues of concern. The Korean Peninsula, um, obviously China has a problem with, uh, with Kim Jong-un, uh, the killing of the uncle, and so forth. And you know, the last thing China wants is that erratic or confrontational North Korean behavior leads to war in the peninsula. The current situation we think is the preferable situation for the Chinese. On the maritime disputes, China continues to avoid military conflict through gray zone tactics, just like the men not in uniform that the Russians sent to Ukraine. They're using law enforcement and economic coercion and other non-military capabilities to strengthen their influence in the maritime areas. They could use nuclear subs in Hainan, which they control, for nuclear deterrence controls. But nuclear shootout, nuclear involvement in a maritime crisis by either China or the US seems highly implausible. Taiwan is where it's much more relevant. Um, there's a lot here. It's a busy slide. Uh, I'm going to skip over it, even though it's in a very important area. I want to get to a couple of final points. Uh, 
China is unquestionably modernizing all aspects of its military and non-military power to bolster its integrated strategic deterrence and to assert long-term dominance over the U.S. and the Pacific. Chinese thinking very, very long-term. Famous quote years ago, Kissinger met with Zhou Enlai in 1976. It was the 200th anniversary of the founding of the United States. Kissinger said to Zhou Enlai, 200 years is a democracy. What do you think? Zhou Enlai said, 200 years? Too early to tell. Long-term, protracted, right out of the Wei Qi playbook. They use gray zone tactics to prevent their show of dominance. They don't want to cross any red lines that could escalate to direct military conflict. They seek to avoid military confrontation. The closest, uh, I happen to be a boxing fan, the closest uh, I've seen to this in real life boxing is Floyd Mayweather. Any of you boxing fans? He's one, you know, he retired, now he's going to come back and fight some other guy. The last 15 or 20 fights, he won every one backing up and counterpunching and avoiding a shootout. Okay. It's a, just as valid a path to victory as John Wayne marching in and killing the bad guys, which is the American approach. So we're facing a radically different adversary than the Soviet Union, which did have very aggressive intent using military force, including nuclear war. This is not the ad adversary we're facing with China. China that doesn't seek any shootout with the United States, but a slow, incremental, steady growth of influence and power, which will dissuade the U.S. from staying involved. They're modernizing their nuclear cyberspace and other disruptive technologies. Now, some key questions for the United States. If it is the case that the most plausible assumption is a systematic increase of Chinese capabilities, and the accumulation of military power, as I've said, what do we do? We have to be more clear, comprehensive, and aggressive in using non-military spheres of influence in the political and economic domain and our technological edge to maintain deterrence against Chinese expansionism. We have to compete with them in the one belt, one road strategy. There's actually a lot of debate how feasible this strategy is, we have to explore its weaknesses and seek to undermine it. Uh, we have to enhance quantitative and qualitative capabilities in all these areas, all these non-nuclear areas, to demonstrate resolve to our allies. Remember, reassurance of our allies remains a key element of the strategy. But just as important is to cast doubt among the Chinese leadership that they could deny us access in the region. And in fact, one way to help, help reinforce their doubt is to promote military to military and high level engagement. It's not, it's not solely for areas of cooperation. If there are areas of cooperation, and there well may be, that's fine. But it's also to reassert our commitment to the region. So there's no ambiguity, there's no miscalculation on the part of Chinese leaders that they can move forward in a way without the U.S. responding. Now, finally, it gets to a key point about U.S. nuclear use. And the classic question, which has been asked for many decades, you know, would the U.S. sacrifice Los Angeles to Taipei? And there are two, at least two concrete operational issues on the table now. Should the U.S. develop low-yield, high-accuracy nuclear weapons that possibly could be used in a conflict with China? The advantage of having those weapons is they would be seen, perhaps by everyone in the region, perhaps even by the Chinese, as credible. We, we would use them, which would strengthen our deterrent of their involvement with Taiwan. The disadvantage is, first, they may not view it as credible because uh, they'll see first use of nuclear weapons by the United States as an invitation for the U.S. to then use nuclear weapons against them, which they don't think the Americans want to do. Um, 
you know, this debate goes back to the 70s when Schlesinger, as Secretary of Defense, spoke about limited nuclear options. And it's almost a theological debate within the nuclear community. Do you have specialized, low yield, highly flexible, accurate systems to shore up deterrence, or do you have those systems and it increases the likelihood of nuclear war? There's no seeming bottom answer to this. It's a trade-off. But this is a question I think the Trump administration, perhaps with the help of the laboratories, is going to have to address. Secondly, what about prompt global strike? You know, this is a strategic non-nuclear system. We've been talking about this for years. We've had R&D programs and development activities for years. It's still not left the drawing board. Um, the, disadvantage, the advantage, of course, is you can attack from long range and not cross the nuclear threshold. Sounds pretty good to me. The disadvantage is the Chinese or the Russians or others cannot tell whether the prompt global strike is a nuclear or non-nuclear system. And if they think it's a nuclear system, they may respond with nuclear retaliation, even though it's a non-nuclear system. How do we get around that conundrum? So these are two concrete areas in the weapons development field which bear directly on the uh, capability of the United States to deter and to dissuade China from further expansionism. My own view is that the likelihood of Chinese maritime expansion is very high and there's very little we can do to try unless we play it off against some totally different area, some economic deal, something totally separate. President Trump with the art of the deal looking at other ways to dissuade them from doing it. But there's nothing we can do militarily, politically, or diplomatically, I think, that's going to stop the maritime expansion. It's too central to their overall strategy. There's not a lot we can do in getting them to lean on the North Koreans beyond what Trump has tried to do. Trump has already said now it's failed. I don't know if that's a definitive assessment or his own personal view or what. Um, Taiwan remains the key element, and, uh, and it's going to take a lot of careful thought and accumulation of U.S. capabilities in a wide variety of fields to continue to sustain Chinese views that the U.S. would engage and therefore deter an attack. So expansion without conflict is what our adversary is about. And we have to figure out ways to counter it. That's our initial thinking on the subject. Happy to take questions and, of course, criticism.